consider having a treadmill uh, stress test uh, with or without nuclear imaging, uh, you can expect, um, I would wear your sneakers, uh, pretend like you're going to the gym, because you're definitely going to be walking vigorously on a treadmill. So the medical assistants will go over that with you, but every three minutes the treadmill will get a little bit faster, a little bit steeper, till you can't go any further. farther. Uh, I think it's generally more vigorous than people expect. Um, and the, your doctor will decide whether you can do a treadmill type stress or a chemical type stress. They're really probably equivalent. Um, if you can do a treadmill stress test, it's equivalent to a chemical type stress test. And again, we're just talking about the stress portion. Whether or not you take pictures of the heart is a separate issue. If you have a LEXA scan stress test, that's a chemical stress test. Um, so sometimes that medication can make people feel bad. Um, it can be reversed. Uh, it's generally well tolerated. Uh, the chance of something bad happening, I would say, is about one in 10,000 chance of a heart attack. So that's whether you walk on the treadmill at a vigorous pace or whether you uh, get the chemical, it's really probably the same. Uh, one in 40,000 chance of death. Uh, so certainly bad things can happen, but the chance is extremely low of something bad happening. Um, it, we may take pictures of the heart before and after using uh, a nuclear imaging agent. Um, you'll just lay under a camera or sit down and pictures will be taken. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, if you're doing a treadmill, you're going to have to reach a certain target heart rate, which is 85% of your maximum predicted heart rate. The medical assistants will tell you what that is generally in advance. Um, if you walk for two minutes on a treadmill and reach your target heart rate, that's really an inadequate stress. So you really have to both reach your target heart rate and walk for some time on the treadmill. So the longer you can go, the better. <clears throat> we certainly do not want people to fall off the back of a treadmill. Um, so you really need to give, a, say, a 30 second warning about um, needing to stop. Um, if you wanna stop and the girls are stopping the treadmill, it will slow down slowly. So you don't stop walking immediately. You keep walking, same pace, and then you slow down with the treadmill. Um, so don't stop walking abruptly. And try to give at least a 30 second warning. If you're having a cardiac cath, uh, it's a, generally a very low risk uh, procedure. That's a direct visualization of the arteries. Uh, we, uh, it's done at the hospital. We make you relaxed with some medication. Um, and you're not asleep all the way, but it's sort of a light twilight type sleep. We give you numbing medicine and the right groin generally. Uh, sometimes it's done through the wrist, and that can be discussed in a separate um, uh, uh, talk. Um, we give you numbing medicine uh, in the groin, put a catheter into the thermal artery. Sometimes we go into the vein as well if we need to measure heart pressure, so put in a temporary pacemaker, depending on different procedures and things. Um, uh, we, through that uh, special sheath uh, or, or large IV, we run a catheter up to the heart, engage the coronary arteries, and inject contrast. and see if uh, you have any blockages. So this is a direct visualization of the coronary anatomy, the gold standard test. And right now there is nothing that's equivalent to this um, as far as accuracy. So we'll see if you have blockages. Um, if you have blockages that are significant, say 60 to 70% or greater, uh, we'll fix them. Uh, the way we do that is blood's having trouble getting through uh, blocked artery. We um, put a balloon there, inflate the balloon, pull it back, and then blood can get through. A lot of times we'll put a stent or wire mesh tube there to help keep the artery open. Um, if you have a cardiac cath and you don't have significant blockages, I would tell you that's the best news we could possibly give you. It's like saying you do not have cancer. Um, generally, you would go home the same day if that's the case. Um, if we uh, sometimes people have blockages that are so severe that they need bypass surgery it's almost never an emergency so if you need if you have severe blockages and require bypass surgery uh, we would talk to you in a non uh, you know urgent more relaxed way and you can decide whether you want to have bypass surgery whether you want to stay in the hospital or go home and uh, come back and have that uh, occasionally it is an emergency, so you are consented for emergency bypass surgery. I would say the chance of that is 1% or less. Um, based on something that we see or something that's done, you would need you know, urgent bypass surgery. Uh, the, if you have blockages that are uh, fixed with a, a balloon angioplasty and stent, you would almost always spend the night. Um, and, and then uh, you 
usually go home the next day. We'd have to be generally on aspirin and Plavix, aspirin and Effian, aspirin and Berlenta. We should be on that um, up to one year or longer, maybe aspirin indefinitely, probably aspirin indefinitely. I would never stop aspirin without talking to your cardiologist. And I wouldn't stop Plavix or Effian or Berlenta unless you talk to the, the interventional cardiologist that did your case. There's different recommendations. Um, it depends on what was done. Um, I would prefer at least a year, but uh, they definitely, you can definitely take um, aspirin and uh, Plavix for less in certain circumstances. But again, do not stop those medications. Do not miss a single dose without consulting with your interventional cardiologist and making sure it's safe. Uh, the risk if you do stop those medications or just are not taking them on a regular basis is acute stent closure, which is the same as a heart attack. So you could die uh, from that. You can have a massive heart attack. Uh, so you never want to stop those medicines without consulting with your interventional cardiologist and, and, and making sure that it's safe. Um, the, the risk of uh, having a cardiac cath is risk of stroke, heart attack, and death, just like with any major procedure or surgery. Just like I'm having my gallbladder or appendix out or colonoscopy, um, that risk is always there. That risk is very low of something bad happening. Uh, risk of vascular complications, I would say, is the main thing. Um, everybody gets a bump and a bruise uh, that goes away over time for almost everybody. Um, the chance of serious blood vessel damage requ requiring surgery, I would say, is less than 1%. There is a um, most of the blood vessel problems, if there are, which are rare, are uh, cured with bed rest. Uh, you may lay, be laying flat for up to six hours or longer after a uh, cardiac cath. Sometimes we'll put in a closure device that can really accelerate that process and get you up in 30 minutes to two hours. Um, it, it's very dependent on what's seen and done during the procedure. Uh, there's a risk of kidney problems. We do check your kidneys and make sure they're okay. There's a risk of an embolic phenomenon, um, meaning that uh, uh, plaque can break off and go down to the legs, uh, where it commonly goes, or to the, to the uh, intestines and such. Um, the chance of that happening is, is generally very low. Uh, we're very careful with the catheters as we bring it up from the, from the femoral artery uh, up to the heart, uh, but it can still happen. If you have uh, chest pain, um, it's really the most common thing that you come to the cardiologist to, to discuss. Uh, you'll see that doctors call your symptoms in the chest chest pain, and that is not, uh, you know, for most people it's something else. It's chest pressure or chest tightness or burning or squeezing or, um, you know, different adjectives to describe that. Uh, some people may have neck pain, some people may just have back pain, some people may have shoulder pain or your arm goes numb and no other symptoms. Some people may just be short of breath when they exert themselves. But a lot of this we will refer to as chest pain, especially if it's in the chest area. We are listening to what you're saying, but because everybody is slightly different, their symptoms are slightly different, we do group it and call it chest pain. So we are listening to what you're saying, but for us that's the general term that um, refers to something going on in the chest and that might need further uh, evaluation. Again, everybody is different. Um, you have to, uh, uh, you know, again, just tell us your symptoms, nausea, breathing, um, uh, you know, whether you get diaphoretic, you know, there are like, all kinds of variations of people not getting enough blood flow to the heart and what their symptoms might be. Um, it's said that females may have more atypical type chest pain, you know, not the typical uh, you know, squeezing type chest pain or elephant sitting on the chest um, kind of symptoms, um, you know, that's, that's variable. Again, there are plenty of females that have very typical chest pain that, that requires evaluation. Um, the things that we use to treat chest pain, um, again, I think the main thing is to determine if it's the heart not getting enough blood, and that's from a blockage in an artery uh, that's supplying blood to the heart. So you may have very typical stand, uh, sounding chest pain, um, but if you, even, if you had a cath, maybe it's totally normal. And uh, despite that, uh, you're still having pain. There's the reasons for that, but again, I think the best news we can give people uh, who are having you know, symptoms like this, and if we did a cath, for instance, uh, is that they don't have any blockages. Um, and 
and that the chest pain is coming from something else. And we do have patients like that, so we have to look elsewhere. The esophagus um, uh, sits in the chest. Uh, you can have esophageal spasm. You can have uh, gastroesophageal reflux, um, all, and you can have uh, pain in the, the joints uh, between the ribs and the sternum. Uh, you can have lung issues, you can have muscle problems, and all of that mimics the heart not getting enough blood. Very difficult to tell even for the most experienced doctors, and I really think if you ask any cardiologist, they're going to say, you know, it can be very difficult to tell. There's no symptom that's 100% or that 100% excludes the heart not getting enough blood. Um, so I think we, do, we definitely take that seriously. Uh, but again, if we do a workup and we don't see anything bad, I think that's good news. Uh, and again, the, the cause of the symptom is from uh, something else. Um, the medications that we use to treat chest pain, commonly we use aspirin. Sometimes we'll add another antiplatelet drug to that. Uh, most commonly that's uh, Plavix if we need to. A lot of times that's in people that have had balloon angioplasty and stent placements. Uh, we'll use a beta blocker, which is a medication that lowers the heart rate and the blood pressure. Um, and again, it helps with chest pain. Sometimes that can make acid reflux worse because it lowers the muscle between the stomach and the esophagus, so acid is more likely to come up into the chest. Um, we use nitrates, long-acting nitroglycerin, and nitroglycerin under the tongue. The use of nitroglycerin under the tongue is a special case, so it generally comes in a, a tiny bottle as tablets. It can come as a spray. I'd, I'd say the tablets last only a few months, and you should keep them fresh. Even if you don't open them, I do think they go bad. They'll have an expiration date that might be a year or two later, but they do go bad quickly, and I would keep them fresh and get new ones every two to three months if, with the tablets. The spray does last longer, probably up to two years, and I would trust that expiration date more. Uh, if you get chest pain, chest pressure, chest tightness, something in the chest that you're concerned about, the first thing I tell people to do is sit down and relax. If it doesn't go away after 10 minutes, then you can put a nitroglycerin under the tongue. Uh, you're going to feel warm all over. It's going to make you uh, give you a whopping headache. It might make you dizzy, uh, but hopefully it'll take away the chest pain. And you can put one under your tongue every five minutes until the pain goes away. But if you have to take three in a row, you need to call 911.